Welcome to the Millennial Investing Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Clay Fink. And on today's show, I'm joined by Beth Kindig. Beth, pleasure having you on the show. Thank you, Clay. My pleasure being here. Thank you for asking. Today, we're going to be chatting about the metaverse and how you're investing in the space, as well as your overall investment process. Now, the metaverse to me seems like this broad term and buzzword that's constantly being thrown around due to Facebook changing their name to Meta. I'd like to open up our conversation to ask you, what is it specifically about the metaverse that sparked your interest in it? Yeah, I think that's a really good question because I think there are so many big tech companies getting into this space. Uh, One thing that I look for is no matter what emerging trend it is, is the difference between a marketing tactic and then real revenue. So I'm constantly looking for signs of real revenue growth. Uh, Usually they're buried into other revenue segments because this is a newer trend. So one great example is that NVIDIA's professional visualization was up, I think about 150% last quarter. Uh, It was up 40% sequentially. You know, that's the kind of thing where you have real revenue growth. You have a company that clearly is meeting demand. And then I would say, you know, meanwhile, uh, Facebook is saying they may lose money on this for some time. Uh, What I'm looking for too, that sparks my interest, uh, especially is the companies that already have an audience that could you know, become an early adopter. Uh, So what companies right now could just change over, create some augmented reality features, put on a lens or uh, create a virtual space with the audience they have now. I'm less interested in companies that want to bulldoze, if you will, with their cash, uh, a, a new emerging trend. What I have found is that that rarely works out. I like the people that have been working on something already for 10 years and, oh, look, serendipitously, we happen to be situated perfectly for this new market. So as somebody that's been only tech focused for a very long time, uh, I've seen so many new emerging trends that uh, has gotten Wall Street very excited that fell flat. I've seen emerging trends that Wall Street has entirely missed that became the next big investment. Um, you know, I guess if I'm going to throw out one that Wall Street constantly got wrong was blockchain. Uh, we, you know, I'm just giving you guys like a, you know, because I think you got to really think of the metaverse before, uh, you know, as an emerging trend. So we have, you know, electric vehicles are an emerging trend. You know, you have these big IPOs pre-revenue. Uh, you have the metaverse an emerging trend. We had blockchain and crypto as an emerging trend, over the past decade, Wall Street completely missed that. Uh, They still sometimes want to debate uh, the viability of Bitcoin uh, or other blockchain technologies. It's starting to wane a little bit, but you wouldn't want to miss that one, um, an early Ethereum or an early, uh, you know, another very infrastructure layer one type altcoin. Uh, But then, you know, you do have other things like autonomous vehicles where it's been promised that we would have level five since I'm pretty sure around 2016, 2017, I started to see a lot of news headlines around full autonomy. Uh, I actually interviewed Intel and Qualcomm and and, uh, a couple others uh, at CES. uh, I think it was in 2018. And we were discussing will autonomous vehicles really be on the road anytime soon? No. Uh, They all said very clearly it would take years. But Wall Street was already bowling up and putting a lot of money there that clearly has not panned out. So I think, and of course, we will have full autonomy eventually. And those companies that do that will make a lot of money. And that's great. But what I'm trying to say is I think the metaverse is actually a little bit of both. I think we do have some companies coming in and saying, whoa, look at this market. I want to be a part of it. And so they're um, trying to just throw a bunch of cash and say, I'm in the metaverse or I'm a metaverse company. And then we have others that are serendipitously centered in this trend that if you can find them, could greatly pay off. Um, So what I'm most interested in with the metaverse are the companies who already possess an audience, growing that audience in a virtual or augmented world. And that piece is probably the most challenging. Yeah, I really like how you're 
trying to find those companies that already have revenue. You know, the obvious one that comes to mind again is Facebook. They already have the Oculus and they're already working on those types of products. And one you've been very vocal about vocal about is NVIDIA. I'm curious, are you seeing any projected growth numbers and like the potential size of the metaverse or how are you able to determine that? Yeah. You know, these companies are starting to see revenue, but you know, are they going to, you know, is this an investable space based on, you know, trying to determine the potential size of the market in the future? Yes. Very investable. Uh, I remember I covered unity at, during its IPO and it was about a year and a half ago in September. Um, and I called it the zero to 100 market because it would basically move so quickly and there'd be so few players. Uh, zero to 100 billion is what I was referencing. Uh, it's When it moves, it's going to be overnight growth for the select few. I think getting those select few right is going to be the biggest challenge. And because I think that a lot of people will say they're a metaverse company or whatnot and Meanwhile, others are truly busy serving that market. Uh, so it's not like cloud, in my opinion, where the early adopters are very easy, right? Like it drives down costs. So like most companies are going to become cloud companies. Uh, adoption is not the key issue with something like cloud. I'm just giving you guys some contrast because it's important as a tech investor to know where does the metaverse fall in line according, compared to some of these other big trends that have been very successful. Um, so my understanding is that we will eventually hit 800 billion uh, market. And the key thing about the 800 billion is that uh, this isn't like ad tech, which has been slowly growing over 20 years. This could potentially happen in a 10 year time frame. So it will move very quickly. Uh, that CAGR is around 40%. Uh, when you compare it to gaming, it's about a $500 billion industry. And when you compare it to Hollywood, it's about a $150 billion industry. Hollywood and gaming as we know it will likely completely shift. Uh, those two seem like you know, low hanging fruit, if you will, the easiest markets for the metaverse to capture uh, the entertainment. And we see that already with how many Hollywood, uh, um, Hollywood companies are merging and Hollywood, uh, you know, people with a lot of Hollywood creative experiences moving into tech companies right now. Unity has, um, you know, they've acquired way high and then uh, NVIDIA has some Hollywood type backgrounds from Lucas game, uh, Lucas and films and games. And those kinds of merging is a pretty big hint that Hollywood is prepared to move into a more virtual or augmented experience for people. Uh, gaming is very low hanging fruit. So when you look at those markets and you say, these markets have taken forever to build, Hollywood's been around for many, many decades and then gaming, you know, maybe you could argue the 80s. I don't know, maybe you'd argue when Xbox and whatnot came out. Regardless, it took many years to build those markets. And what the metaverse is proposing is, you know, two, three X more in about 10 years. Uh, however, there's, uh, you know, a, a disclaimer here is that we do often see these big market projections and sometimes they, they don't fully materialize. Uh, until we see a lot of real audience revenue growth, um, that means the people, the, you know, the eyeballs, the whatever you want to call it, growing that revenue, uh, that's when, you know, that market prediction is most likely to come to fruition. So I wouldn't say we're seeing a lot of evidence right now that people are rushing towards any given, you know, augmented experience. Uh, Roblox might be the best example. Uh, clearly they have, I want to say, I want to say 40 million users. I need to look that up again. And 40 million is night is, is a good size, but it's certainly not the 2 billion that Facebook has or the uh, roughly 300 million that other social media companies have uh, between your, your, your runner ups, your snaps, your Twitters, things like that. So I wouldn't say that we're in a place where an augmented experience is a leading app 
today, uh, Roblox is probably the best example of a real revenue growth coming from audience, uh, if you were to boil it down that way. Yeah, you mentioned that the somewhat obvious plays for the early stages of the metaverse are gaming and Hollywood. You mentioned Roblox and Unity. Those are on the gaming side. And, you know, the metaverse kind of ties into NFTs too and this, you know, strong feeling of people wanting to be a part of a community. And one that came to mind for me was Disney. And I think that ties in with the Hollywood piece because Disney, you know, really gives this community feel and gives you this just a unique experience, which I find really fascinating. And tying back into the gaming piece, I think a lot of what we're seeing today for the metaverse, you know, appears to look like a video game. It doesn't yet resemble reality or feel like indistinguishable from reality. And I'm curious with that, how do you go about investing in this trend? Who do you believe that will be some of the big leaders in this space early on? Yeah, I think that's a really good, uh, you know, a really good question. And I, one thing I would want to emphasize um, that I have not touched on yet is I think consumers will be the hardest to convert. Uh, you know, there's a lot of industry use cases where you can simulate buildings. And so architects are now able to uh, find problems in their design before they go and build a very, very expensive building. Uh, you know, NVIDIA is able to uh, train neural networks for automotive automation. So instead of having a bunch of vehicles driving around the road, uh, they can do this. uh, They can simulate a city and they can have lots of, you know, uh, robotics and automotive automations occurring to where now you can just put that system into a real life vehicle. Um, So those are the kinds of things where you, you know, you and you and I walking through our day may not realize the need there that is so, um, you know, incredibly innovative for many industries, I would say healthcare, medical as well, if you could simulate surgeries, help uh, surgeons train that way, they may become much sharper when you and I are, you know, needing that kind of surgery. So uh, all of that, those industries are probably more likely to adopt the metaverse faster than consumers who are very habit driven. You have to change habits. So that's really tough. Um, Then I would say within your, you know, you've got your gaming as a consumer market, then you've got your millennials or your Gen Z uh, they are also more likely to be early adopters because they tend to pick up technology a little bit quicker than older generations. Uh, so when I look for investments, I'm definitely looking for companies that serve that. Unity serves those markets. Uh, NVIDIA certainly serves those markets. So those are really interesting companies to me. And then the others I would say are serving um, maybe younger generations. And also, I'm trying to keep really very realistic time frame here. Uh, As you can see, tech gets beat up. We're very used to this. Uh, I would say this is more severe than typical. Um, But I expect and fully uh, prepare for 40 to 60% drawdowns every single year. Uh, There's always a new narrative as to why that drawdown occurred. Uh, This one's steeper. We're seeing some um, tech stocks get beat up even more than 60%. Some are hitting 80%. It's very, very scary if you don't have a strong understanding of your time horizon. I can't stress that enough. So I could sit here and tell you, you know, here are a couple of companies I think are interesting, but 2022 is not the right year to put your money in and expect to get it back out. If you're going to put your money in in 2022, you need to be fully prepared to not take that, touch that money until 2025, maybe 2027. Um, the very, very best investors in the world who do this professionally and make, you know, eight figures, nine figures off of emerging tech are venture capitalists and they cannot withdraw their money for seven years, even if uh, there is a recession. 
uh, a depression or whatever, they cannot take their money back out. So you got to really think, you know, about what are the most professional and highest yielding investors doing in tech? They're holding an emerging product and company and management team for seven years. Tech needs time to breathe and grow and pull back and expand. And what they're proposing to do, if you take on the metaverse, is absolutely uh, incredible. I mean, to, to create, a, some would call it a virtual reality, some would call it, um, you know, an augmented cyberspace. Uh, some would say it's basically more of a 3D internet. Uh, whatever you want to define it as, uh, whatever this becomes is going to be so incredible that to put your money in in one given year and expect to get it back out six months later is not being realistic at all. Uh, if you're investing in the metaverse, uh, you know, 10 years, 800 billion, you should expect to be in it for five to seven years. It's a very early, early trend. So more important than my exact opinion on a pick is time horizon. And I can't stress that enough because uh, the market is really, really hard to time. And the hardest thing to do is to try to withdraw your money, time the market and get back in. If you're a day trader, and I'm just like really touching on this point because of the current environment we are in. If you're a day trader and you dedicate every minute of your life to trading stocks, um, you rarely know what they do. You cannot tell me the difference between NVIDIA and AMD or Intel, for instance, they will exit very quickly and they will be quite proud of that. But an investor like myself, who truly believes NVIDIA will be one of the most valuable companies in the world, I, I, you know, and I've expanded on that in analysis, why would I ever exit NVIDIA? Because I truly know what this company is doing. So I, there's a, those are two different styles and I don't, get confused as to what my style is. I don't look at the people that exit not knowing truly what the market will deliver in the, you know, with the metaverse or AI or automation and get concerned that they may have pulled their money out and maybe I should have. That's, that doesn't cross my mind um, because to time that means that every second, every minute of my day, I have to be prepared to get back in. And rarely do people exit and, and, and think to get back in because they've emotionally and psychologically close this position now. So to me, uh, long story short, it's all about time horizon with tech, you, you know, and I think you got to be really careful of seeing the market give losses. NVIDIA is very much down right now. Um, I've been through many moments where NVIDIA was down and I did not budge. Uh, to me, there's no doubt uh, where NVIDIA is headed. So that's just an example. I mean, Unity is a great example too. Unity has gotten clobbered a couple of times since its IPO. Uh, I, you know, if you look at the company, they rank really high in uh, gaming revenue. And like I said, the lowest hanging fruit for the metaverse is going to be gaming. And now they're able to take their serendipitous position and go and serve other industries, um, your architects, your automotive engineers, whatever it is. So Again, it goes back to if you're a very, very active stance, you might have closed 10 positions um, because you don't know what they, you, you know, you're not really diving super deep into what they do. But to me, um, you know, finding certain stocks, and I've played a little bit with my entry in Unity, but, and, and, and just sitting there and letting them become the tech that they've, you know, said in their earnings calls, they're already, they already have, they already have product market fit, they're already growing is way more, is one of the most important pieces. So I just want to, I'm going to like talk about what companies I like. I think the most important thing that I can communicate is that when you find a company that you like, know your style. Are you an investor or are you a day trader or a very active, knowing that the, by large and far, the best gains in tech come from venture capitalists who cannot touch their money for seven years. So they, I mean, they don't have, they need to get an exit. So I just want to make sure people understand that if you're trying to get into the metaverse, day trade, get quickly back out. If the market doesn't like high beta, then that's a, that's a losing proposition. And um, for me, at least, because why would I ever exit um, quality companies? Uh, I, we trim them. 
So if we see them topping out, we'll trim and we try not to buy at the top and those trade alerts are sent to people, um, you know, where we did not buy at the top, we bought, you know, as the gains were going up. But at the same time, uh, the most important thing that I'm communicating is um, oh, the time horizon is absolutely essential for the metaverse or anything tech related. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. I think a lot of people try and get into these high growth names after they've already gone up. They think they'll be able to make a quick buck. And that's when the market can really turn on you and you end up really losing money. And, you know, the market can really play with investor psychology a lot. And obviously, a good time to buy growth stocks is when they're down significantly while the fundamentals of the business haven't really changed that much. How do you ensure that you're not buying a falling knife, so to speak? Are you relying on technical indicators for adding to positions? Because we've seen a lot of growth names really get hit recently, as you've already mentioned. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, our process actually is fundamentally, for, I would say fundamentals forward. So uh, we will close a position if we feel the story has changed. Let's use NVIDIA for an example. Um, if their professional visualization revenue suddenly plummeted and it couldn't get back up for a couple quarters, that story could have changed. It will. I don't think it will. I'm just giving you guys an example. So we're looking at certain revenue segments. Uh, we are looking through financials. A lot of companies are interconnected. So if some are spending in one way, uh, that is a um, you know, trickle-down effect, uh, a tailwind for other industries. So we are fundamentally forward. And then, so we're, our entries are fundamental, uh, are driven on fundamentals. Our exits tend to be driven on technicals. So at Teladoc, we got out at the top and then you know, because this technicals were, were kind of screaming and flashing. However, we have some long-term convictions. Uh, I really like Roku because I think that their first-party data on connected TV ads and moving even beyond their own, uh, you know, operating, operating system and player to run ads the opposite direction, most things have been driven from mobile uh, for attribution and targeting. Uh, Roku now has the opportunity to step in and, and run some of that through their connected TV ad first party data. Uh, so that shift we saw with Facebook yesterday, um, th the real reason it's selling off is it was buried in the call, but they said they could lose up to 10 billion in revenue from the iOS changes. Um, where's that revenue going to go? Uh, I think Roku is sitting in a good spot. So long story short, uh, even though I like the fundamentals, um, I have a portfolio manager who's very good at technicals. We did not buy at the 470 range, and these are real-time trade alerts, uh, that, so our customers always know exactly when we're buying. Um, the highest position I'm looking to step right now was um, 350, so it's still a little bit of a drawdown right now. Uh, we obviously have a ton of gains in the stock because we bought it at 30 to begin with, but uh, so it's like, how do you buy in the middle? You know, how do you not get stuck at the very top so that you can get gains when you come back? Uh, the other one would be Zoom. I like Zoom long term. I think cloud communications are going to disrupt telecom as we know it. There's no reason for us to have phones anymore. It can all be run through the cloud. Uh, companies and enterprises are sure to see that especially as budgets come under pressure from inflation. So with Zoom, for instance, and actually I think Zoom is a great metaverse play too. I mean, they have customers that could do virtual meetings and that would be a great partnership that they already have uh, set up with Facebook. So I'm just looking up our Zoom entry was about 320 and Zoom eventually was up at uh, 559. So we kind of are like middle buyers were, you know, to, to try to, and of course we bought Zoom originally at $90. So uh, overall the position has gains, but I'm telling you like our last position uh, is holding at a loss right now because we expect in the next, you know, year or two, those, all those positions will have sizable gains. Um, one reason we actually show those losses is because investors need to get real comfortable with them. The, the, the reason why the market takes people's money is that people panic when they have a loss. Nobody likes to talk about them on FinTwit or on Twitter or anywhere. It's always, oh, I was the first person ever to Tesla or whatever it might be. And the reality is that 
great quality tech companies with the best management teams in the entire industry will be down at times. So, and like I said, you're looking at 40 to 60% drawdowns every single year. I'm going to be a tech investor for the next 10 to 15 years. I have 10 to 15 more drawdowns in my future. So I have to be really careful around obviously knowing that these companies will resuscitate and they will go even higher. Great example. I am down 50% or more in Roku for the fourth time. And that stock had four digit gains, 1000% gains for me at one point. It's obviously less now, but uh, because of the current sell-off, but I fully expect that to be a four digit winner. So to get a 1000% gain, you have to be willing to hold four 50% drawdowns. Uh, We're going on two to three of those for some of our other winning positions. Um, So just to, oh, NVIDIA, I mean, my goodness, you know, Uh, That one's been all over the place. I actually was having an interview the other day uh, with Charles Payne, and he mentioned how NVIDIA went from $12 to $1 in the 2008 financial crisis. Could you imagine? I'm I'm not going to say, could you imagine getting NVIDIA at a dollar? I'm going to say, could you imagine getting NVIDIA at $12? You know, and so like you obviously don't want to buy at the very top. You want to buy in the middle, but you also have to be realistic that nobody buying in the middle uh, is going to get out without uh, losses temporarily. And then the market will uh, boost you back up. Be- why? Because they're quality tech companies. Uh, and that's, that's the thing that people need to really understand is uh, if you know what these companies are doing, if you had any idea where GPUs were about to go, um, like with NVIDIA, um, the parallel processing, the fact that they could run inference and training on one chip, if you had any clue about that, Uh, $12 would have been a steal, $6 would have been incredible, and $1 would have been probably very unrealistic because nobody really ever catches the bottom. So just to frame that conversation right uh, is buying a falling knife, you you know, the, the fundamentals should be really strong. So I'm a tech product person. I've been doing tech products for a long time. Um, at least 10 or 11 years in Silicon Valley, which is obviously the most competitive market. And I pulled in a really sharp financial analyst. He's incredible. He looks at every little line item and can model where this tech company is about to go. He has sharpened up um, our convictions. And then we have a technical analyst who is saying, hold on tight, we're going to go down and then it's going to go back up. Um, He's predicting it's, you know, February 3rd, just to reference when this conversation is, he thinks we're going to go one more leg lower. And then that should be maybe it for this big sell-off. So those kinds of uh, roles combined makes it to where we're not catching a falling knife. I can count very few positions that I probably can count on one hand, the amount of positions we've closed for a loss that we never revisited. Um, meaning every company that I've really covered and held has some gains within one to two years of holding it. That's pretty exceptional, right? Because technically you're supposed to hold for seven years. Um, So any, you know, I started moving from the private markets and covering corporate enterprise products uh, for enterprise companies over to the public markets in 2018 and most of my 20, all of my 2018, 2019 recommendations are well into the mid triple digits. So that tells you how long you have to hold. And we do a ton of research. So how do you know you're not catching a falling knife? If you're a individual investor hearing this right now, I would either do that research or find people that will do that research for you. We're not the only people that do great, incredible research for retail. Um, I think that retail individual investors need to be really good about finding the right people um, and sticking with them is probably the way to not catch a falling knife. Yeah, the common theme here I'm getting is do your homework and recognize those trends and understand that all the best investments ever really have gone through these massive bull and bear cycles where it overshoots to the upside and, uh, and, and overshoots to the downside. So you have to be re- ready to hold on through that volatility. Could you talk a little bit more about your fund and what you look for and the trends that 
you're looking to identify in the IO fund you have? Yes, we are always really keen on a couple of things. One is trends fall out of favor and then they come back really quickly if they're tried and true quality trends. Um, Ad tech has been beaten down so badly that I think we will reference this, you know, these months for for years to come. Uh, Ad tech is very cash efficient. And so we've kept allocation there. And even though it's been brutally beat down, uh, this is one where it doesn't add up. Uh, Advertisers are going to continue to advertise. And if the rates, CPMs, whatever it might be, go down, more advertisers tend to step in. We saw that with the March of 2020 crash where uh, eventually people just stepped in and bought the ads because now you had, instead of $11, um, you know, on Facebook, you had seven or eight. That's a bargain. Uh, for a lot of advertisers. So they're going to step in. Um, And I'm not into Facebook. I don't own Facebook. I'm just using that as an example. Uh, There are other ad tech companies where it, you know, it doesn't really make much sense to completely penalize them for these transitory headwinds. Um, So we'll look for something that's greatly out of favor and we will hunker down and hold and, and hold some of those positions especially if it's quality, it's been around, these industries have been around a long time, where you can get into trouble doing that are like pre-revenue SPACs or a supplier for electric vehicles that has, you know, 50 competitors. I actually looked up an electric bus at one point, did a competitive analysis, which is huge in tech. You always have to look at the competitors. Nothing is more competitive. No industry is more competitive than tech. So the competitive analysis has to be really strong. And I was doing that on Proterra, I'll just say the name. It doesn't matter which electric bus though, because they're all in the same boat. There are 30 competitors for electric buses right now. It's like, how do you even begin to determine, you know, which one will take the lead? That's too much competition for too small of a pie of the market. Uh, So, you know, and this isn't an industry, electric vehicles, where you can model this industry has been around 50, 60 years. Like you know, advertising has been around forever. I mean, that's, you know, print, radio, whatever, um, television, and now, you know, mobile and connected TV ads and it keeps going. So though I'm just trying to give you a contrast as to like, we will be attracted to trends that model well and are cash efficient, that are beaten down, but we will not be attracted to trends that are losing money, have no revenue and have a ton of competitors um, and our very startup, you know, the early stage startups really that are now on the public markets. So then the other thing we'll look at is uh, the economic macro environment. I mean, obviously, uh, cloud is deflationary. Uh, if there's one thing you get from this interview, I would say that cloud is deflationary. So it's really interesting because there's, uh, I would almost call it alternate reality where the market wants to tell us they're going to get out of high beta because of inflation. You get the number one place that will be still standing once inflation runs its course or whatever it might be is going to be cloud. Uh, Companies save a lot of money by adopting cloud products. So now their budgets look a lot better. Uh, Cloud infrastructure as a service has um, high costs. So any companies that drive that down are going to be very popular over this next year. So that's another one where it's like, it doesn't quite match. The narrative just doesn't match reality. Another place where the narrative doesn't match reality that we, that's our sweet spot. I love when the narrative does not match reality um, is the, the, the chip shortage. Obviously the chip shortage has hurt some companies, but if you look at the financials, uh, a lot of chip companies are doing quite well. And this chip shortage noise has been going on for minimum one year, right around at least a year, I'd say. And I was telling, you know, our members that a year ago that this is not a chip shortage, this is a surge in demand. So you got to like reframe that. It's like, is this uh, investable? Of course, because there's so many industries that are relying on chips at this point, industries that have never really needed chips at this level automotive is a great example. It's exponentially grown uh, that the chip companies are getting overwhelmed um, and, and the supply isn't happening as quickly as needed. So 
how could that not be bullish? So I think that the market scared people. And meanwhile, some of the most steady performers, the most steady performers last year, everyone wants to say it's FANG, but it wasn't. It was semiconductors. Um, it's just retail doesn't, is not attracted to semiconductors because they're really tough tech. We are comfortable analyzing tough tech, you know, like more technical stuff. And uh, that's a sweet spot for us. And uh, there's a lot of emerging semiconductor companies that are starting to take market share. So that can be confusing, I think, for retail and individual investors and professional institutions as well. But those are the places we like the most. So to wrap it up, I would say, you know, really cash efficient companies that are beaten down and are safe because the industry has been around for, you know, longer than you and I have been alive. Those, those tend to do okay. And then you've got um, your cloud deflationary, and then you've got semiconductor surge in demand, not shortage of supply. I understand that there are some supply constraints. I get that. But what I'm saying is like, it's overwhelmed because of, you know, how many industries need chips now. Okay, so all of that. And then you've got these already proven winners that I think also get beaten down. And I like that spot. Um, I like it when a management team is the best at what they do. Uh, I would put Zoom and Roku in that category. So there is some uncertainty there. The market has clearly priced that in. Uh, why would the top product fail? I mean, it's almost like, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of people might watch football or something. And it's like, would you ever gamble in Las Vegas that Tom Brady is going to fumble? Sure. It does happen, but you're talking about, you know, someone on the field who has clearly proven themselves. I would not bet against them. Um, even if you're on, you know, maybe you're on the sidelines, that's great. I understand, uh, you know, stepping aside while the market sorts it out. Uh, there are a few that we have decided to hold a strong conviction on no matter what the market says. And I tend to do that if I think the management team has already done the un unimaginable, which Roku has always taken the number one position against Google and Amazon. Like, how did they do that? That's crazy. And they've still done it. And then you've got Zoom who, you know, came in out of nowhere for a lot of people. We were already in Zoom. Actually, we got into Zoom January before COVID because I actually said, and this is in print, that in September that Zoom would go viral. And then it went viral. And the reason is that the product had a viral component um, and then a viral mechanic. And I put that in a, uh, you know, a research paper in September. And then that's that technical analyst, my portfolio manager who came in and said, we're not going to buy in September. We're going to buy in January. And we literally bought the lowest price you could possibly ever have in Zoom. Um, and we did that pretty decent in Roku too. Not the lowest price, but the lowest price after its IPO. Um, after it went up to 60 and went back down to 30 its first time. So anyways, I, you know, it's like, uh, you know, if we're going to go back to this analogy, Tom Brady doesn't ever always throw a perfect ball. Like Babe Ruth didn't hit every single baseball. Um, investors get really discouraged when they see some, you know, in this situation, in this situation, technically the investor is Babe Ruth. If you're going to go up and hit the ball, um, it is impossible to hit every ball um, and make a home run. So you've got to be like understanding of what does success really truly look like in the markets. And I think people have a warped understanding of that, um, which is that, you hit every ball every time and you can't uh, ever revisit that ball, so to speak. So in this case, um, we, you know, uh, you know, in this case, what I'm trying to say is that investors could be really discouraged in the current environment right now. And what I would say is um, wait, come back. Let's talk in a year and let's see what happens because um, I don't believe for one minute that tech is, not going to be uh, the leading industry over the next 10 years. So, You've talked a little bit about the digital ad space and you're talking about how these, you look for those places in the market where the expectations aren't matching reality. And it reminds me of Facebook's earnings yesterday. I'm not invested in Facebook or yeah. super well researched on them. But what I do know is they are growing really fast and they're trading at something like 
a 17 times trailing PE, which is well below the market multiple. So it's this higher growth company in an industry that's still growing at a very fast pace, but it's just one of those companies that seems where the expectations don't really match reality. So that's something that I would personally like to dig into further. And I'd, I'd also like to follow up on one of your points you made there. You said that Zoom has this viral component to it. Mm-hmm. Could you expand on that? Yes. So we actually published in September of 2019 about Zoom's viral component and we fully believed it would go viral because you could share the URLs. Like, you know, you sent me one and I just click and I'm in. Um, That's viral because there's zero friction and to remove friction from communications creates a viral component because now um, you're sharing a link. I'm sharing a link. We're sharing it over there. We're sharing it over there. And nobody has to sit there and download a bunch of bulky software on their computer or their phone in order to join a call. Um, That may look simple. That is incredibly hard to do. And like the, the amount of vision, the amount of vision that CEO had to have there, um, people are underestimating um, that was, it's, it's a, so communications is something we all do. Um, it's at the core of how, you know, however many people are on this earth, 7 billion go about their day. So you can go viral if you're serving such big needs for, you know, everyone, every man, woman, and child on the world, in the world. I mean, that's, that's your viral moment is Facebook as a social media company, 10, 15, whatever it was years ago, was able to give a product that every man, woman, and child could use. Um, so here's the catch though, is that the market has beaten down Zoom on the consumer story and technically Zoom was never trying to serve the 7 billion. They were creating such a great enterprise product that if you're a CEO or you're whatever, head of marketing or whoever it might be is on the plane, you need to join a call, they can just quickly join a call. If they are, you know, you know, imagine, um, I don't know if you remember the Cisco WebEx years, but it was so hard to always figure out like, okay, did it, did, did the software update, did this happen? And now I'm on my mobile, whoops, I didn't have Cisco downloaded. It was just so clunky. And he came from Cisco, of course. So now you've got your, you know, whoever it might be, that maybe it's the marketing person who set up the company-wide call or maybe it was, uh, or, you know, operations or something. They can just send that to the 500, to the 1,000, to the 10,000, the 20,000 people, and they can all immediately get on the call. Um, that's a big deal, actually. People don't realize how big of a deal that is. And then, of course, the video quality and things of that sort. So um, when I said Zoom could go viral, what I met is they had removed so much friction from the product compared to its competitors that sharing those links was a very uh, easy thing to do among thousands of people if you're at a big company or uh, among your friends and family. Um, Those are the kinds of product things that we drill down into because, you know, you're saying, how do you make sure you're not catching a falling knife? Um, I think it really helps to know what the company does. I think it's easy to know what McDonald's or Walgreens does Um, Tech is another world and knowing what the product does is key. And then some of this other stuff about the fundamentals and the financials. That makes sense. Now, you know that the the macro environment and the Federal Reserve's monetary policy has a big impact on growth stocks. And that's something that's been in the headlines a, a ton as of late. The Federal Reserve states that they want to try and raise interest rates this year. How do you think about the effect that might have on growth stocks is has the market kind of priced in the hikes that they're going to have, or how do you think about that? Yeah. So that is actually something the portfolio manager uh, writes really long in depth reports on. Um, So that's really a better question for him. What I would say though, from my perspective is that obviously the fed does, you know, regulate and introduce monetary policy, but uh, they don't. Uh, they don't innovate. The Fed does not innovate, and so basing your investments off the Fed, if you're truly a believer of innovation, like I am, is a losing game. Now we obviously don't want to um, fight the Fed. Nobody wants to fight the Fed. Those are those are two different things. There's a lot of nuances, I would say, within how to approach that. 
Um, we also aren't fully convinced there will be as many rate hikes as the Fed has said there will be, but we'll see. We aren't, you know, white knuckling type analysts. Uh, we are very flexible. We change if we need to. Uh, we try to be very dynamic. But technically speaking, uh, we think there's one more leg lower. And then we think there, we should be pretty much done with this one. Um, so this sell-off. So uh, look for that, I guess. And if something changes, um, then we'll be agile enough and flexible enough to um, address that. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one thing I guess I would add to that is um, we are actually seeing some oversold levels compared to dot com time. Uh, if you took like the percentage of NASDAQ and Russell that is off their all time highs, um, we're pretty getting close to dot com level. Uh, totally two different worlds that we live in today. So most tech companies are growing 40% or more, at least the ones that we invest in are. And no tech companies were growing like that when the dot-com bust happened. In 2010, tech overtook oil as the world's most valuable industry. Uh, tech, tech's role has completely changed. And so it's really tough or unfortunate to have that narrative out there because um, the bounce back... So we, we had the perfect... Uh, almost, uh, what would you call it? Like test run, trial run with COVID. We had extreme economic conditions. The whole country shut down. Um, you could only go to the grocery store. We saw, you know, every business shut. And what do you think that did to the budgets? They plummeted, right? Like most companies were not bringing in any revenue. Who let us out of that? Tech. Um, why? Because it drives down costs. Uh, so, that was a great trial run, I think, for what role is tech playing after 20, 30, you know, 2020, 20, whatever, 20, 25 years now, um, a whole different role, right? Like if that, if we had March of 2020, the economic sh shelter in place um, with, you know, pets.com or whatever it was, uh, tech would not have, you know, the dot-com bus, the dot-com companies, tech would not have let us out of that. So I think that overall, what the market will have to contend with is, do I, you know, these are your bigger smart money institutional investors. Do I put my money in, you know, industries that have tons of headwinds, you know, that are very sensitive to consumer, uh, you know, or commodities and bonds that don't yield nearly what tech can yield, or do I put it in these quality companies that continually show up and put 40% or more growth? Um, Microsoft came in strong, Google came in strong, AMD came in crazy strong. So now like, yeah, yeah Facebook missed, but we've, you know, I've talked about IDFA for years. My first article ever was that in 2018 for the public markets, I've written tons before that for tech startups, but was Facebook has serious privacy issues. Why are public investors not understanding that? Um, that Cambridge Analytica was not going to go away, that that was the moment that Facebook's privacy issues would forever impact the company. Um, I was really strong on that because I could tell the public markets did not know how they used third-party data. They use third-party data in ways that no other company uses it. So if third-party data is coming under attack, Facebook's hanging out there as like the only company that has been using it in that manner. Um, so long story short, I don't think Facebook's miss is indicative of anything. I think it's indicative of how they've been using third-party data since really 2014 when they launched Audience Network. And my prediction in 2018 was that this company was going to lose its access to third-party data, which just happened in the earnings report. So that's a very unique story that is not representative of tech as a broader industry. So Facebook's got to come back from that. They got to figure out what's their next move now that third-party data has been shut down or diminished, at least on iOS. So basically, long story short, uh, this earnings season, uh, you know, is going to be interesting because people are saying, you know, tech is too high beta and it's too risky. And yet tech is going to be the only industry putting up big growth for 
the foreseeable future. So let's see who wins that tug of war. I think it's going to be tech. If that makes, I hope that makes sense because in 2010 tech's role really changed, became the most valuable industry over oil. So we've had trial runs in March of 2020 to see what that looks like. Now, with these technology names that you own, volatil- volatility is something that you're very, very familiar with. So mm. when I was looking into your fund and the articles you're writing, I wasn't surprised to see Bitcoin in there. Mm-hmm. And Bitcoin's currently down 50% as well, you know, like these other growth names. I'm curious yes. what your view is on the asset for this year and the long term as well. I could not be more bullish on Bitcoin. I would put it up there with like an NVIDIA um, on current conviction. I think eventually it will top out and we will probably take a lot of gains. Um, we see it definitely above six figures uh, for sure before we take any gains. And I think that that's really helpful, right? It's just not only do we show our losses in real time, but we show our gains. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm sorry, we, we show when we take gains. So we did actually trim a lot in the 60,000 range because we felt like it was going to go through a pullback. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'll put this out there. I don't know anyone that has allocated better to Bitcoin alongside stocks than us. Uh, and that's because we are so drilled into the technical sentiment. Um, I, you know, we have a chart that we put out as to when we bought, when we sold, when we bought, when we sold, and we're frequently buying very close to the bottom, selling close to the top. It is a key position for us. Our portfolio could get hammered if we weren't careful uh, because we have uh, a 10% position. Our 10, the other thing I should throw out there is our allocations are very key. Our 10% positions are really well protected. We'll take a hit on a two or 3%. And that's important for people to see because one day those two to 3% will become a 10%. But uh, we, we really closely manage our largest positions and Bitcoin is one of our largest positions. Uh, so boy, how many drawdowns have I been in with Bitcoin? <laughs> I mean, I had said four on Roku and beyond that with Bitcoin at this point. Uh, I don't even care. I, and I'm not trying to be calloused. I just refuse, and I do have somebody who, again, knocks, who trims at the 60s, buys at the 30s. But let's say we get caught up and like we didn't quite trade that perfectly. I just don't care. Like I, I don't need to be concerned because I know Bitcoin will eventually go over six figures. So um, I think, again, trying to hit every single ball perfectly, not even Babe Ruth could do that. So be careful of trying to never see a loss on your record, um, you know, short term, near temporary. So Bitcoin, get like buckle up, get used to it. It's an emerging trend. Crypto is an emerging trend. Um, and don't let, you know, Wall Street and the other ones bully you out of a great position. Um, and that's really the key thing, I would say, around crypto and blockchain. Um, crypto and blockchain, I think I had mentioned, is like the one where Wall Street got it wrong. Wall Street's going to keep getting it, getting it wrong. Um, and I think you got to look at track records um, and stick with the people who have really strong track records. Again, we're not the only ones by any means. Um, I did start giving away free Bitcoin coverage, I think around the 10,000 mark. And we bought on our premium side at the 7,000 mark. It went down to 4,000. It looks a lot like what some positions look like now, which is like, we didn't really stress it. We said Bitcoin's going to do great long term. Does anyone care that, you know, it was down almost 50% today back when it was at 7,000? No. And so that's the kind of reminders. I think transparency is so incredibly important is that we show you that we hold those losses. And that's so incredibly important. We're an actively managed portfolio completely transparent. We beat ARC over and over again. We were positive in 2021 after being up triple digits. Um, in, I'm sorry, we were positive in 2021 and we, were, we beat ARC in 2020. So um, ARC was down, I think, 30% and we ended up positive. So that comes down to allocations um, and making sure your top 10% allocations are going to win this year. Uh, that's key. So that transparency, I think, is something we are all really confident on. And when someone says, oh, my God, you're somebody tried to give us a hard time because we were down a little bit on a Shopify position. And I'm like, oh, man, buckle up, because 
you know, in a year or two, Shopify is going to be a leading tech stock. It's a fang contender. I mean, I think Shopify could be one of the most valuable companies too in the, in the world next to NVIDIA, like that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, do we care about a loss on Shopify? Absolutely not. I lose zero sleep over that. So I hope that makes sense around, you know, uh, Bitcoin. I want to really put it into, it's a psychological mindset thing. Um, it's one that uh, I've never stressed, even when the market was on our back a lot with how much of a scam, I think it was the kind of thing was what it was called. And, you know, listen, global populations don't like the fiat system and it's incredibly secure. It's more secure than 10,000 banks combined. And it serves a real need. Uh, El Salvador, this was, you know, incredible. They gave away a hundred dollars or something of that sort for free Bitcoin and more people got a crypto wallet than have a real bank account. Um, like, whoa, you know, and that goes back to every man, woman and child kind of TAM, uh, total addressable market thing. Bitcoin has that. And uh, a lot of people are really concerned that it'll get regulated. And I think it's going to be really hard with that much attention from the masses, uh, if that makes sense. So, Are ARC talks a lot about, you know, the adoption on company balance sheets, especially like public companies. Are there any catalysts you foresee for Bitcoin or is it just overall, you know, global adoption? I think the biggest catalyst. So I had a few catalysts written out in 2019 for the free newsletter. Um, the first one was I actually said economic uh, uncertainty. Uh, because you and I comfortably live in a country where, for the most part, our dollar is safe. We put money in the bank account, it's safe. Um, but the far majority of, um, you know, uh, the population in the, in the world uh, does not feel safe putting their money in the bank and their currency can be very volatile. So um, that, that concern and those fears around their money uh, I, what I'm trying to say is like, you can, it's called product bias when you only buy stocks that represent your choices. And I would say Bitcoin is very popular in countries that are lower GDP because there's so much uncertainty in their financial systems. And we don't quite have that here. Um, so maybe it's harder for us to wrap our head around why, uh, you know, we saw that happen in El Salvador, but we had, kind of predicted that because Venezuela went through something similar earlier many years ago where the uh, inflation was so bad that their currency was and, and their currency was so weak that even the extreme volatility of Bitcoin outperformed their currency. Uh, and so we were seeing a flood of, and of Venezuelans buying Bitcoin. Uh, so economic uncertainty. And I was saying even now in the United States, uh, with everything the Fed did uh, with liquidity is could be concerning to a lot of people, uh, including myself. So to hedge that, Bitcoin is a good option. After economic uncertainty, mobile payments was another catalyst we had outlined, uh, which is getting easier and easier with the Lightning Network. Uh, look to square, uh, block, square, block, whatever. Um, you know, they're a great example of paving the way for mobile payments. Uh, obviously, there is a lot of work to do there. Um, Bitcoin is not very stable, so we'll see some altcoins probably uh, serve that need where it's more stable. So you can basically be a back, back end moneymaker kind of thing. And so that's one is fixing the stability piece, but mobile payments. And then the other is institutional adoption, which I think has been sol largely solved for. Uh, we had seen Fidelity as an early adopter in the institution space when we first wrote about it. Uh, they were all over Bitcoin when Chase and Jamie Dimon were bearish. And I was leaning more towards Fidelity because, uh, you know, I think their CEO is a woman, actually, which is pretty neat. So, yeah. So basically, um, I would say those are the key things. And we've ticked some of those boxes already. Uh, economic uncertainty probably has been ticked. And then it might be ticked even more as time goes on. And then the um, institutional adoption. So what would be left is mobile payments. Yeah, it's very exciting. I think a lot of funds that only hold stocks are very skeptical about 
Bitcoin. So it's, it's really cool talking to someone like you where you have the flexibility to have the open mind to, you know, go into a new asset class that, you know, the adoption rates just growing very fast. So Beth, with that, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. I really appreciate you sharing your insights on the metaverse, emerging trends, Bitcoin, and growth stock investing. Before we close out the episode, where can the audience go to learn more about you and the IO Fund? Yeah, thanks for the question. I would go to our site and sign up for our free newsletter. Every week we send out really quality analysis from myself and two financial analysts, and sometimes the portfolio manager does macro. So, you know, we work really hard on that free analysis to make it accessible to everyone. Uh, We also have a premium product uh, that allows people to see every trade we do. They actually are, our trades are texted to your phone uh, through SMS and they are emailed to you. So uh, real-time portfolio management, and you'll see when we're buying and when we're selling. And it's also really great probably to see even with this current sell-off, there's key positions we've been building. So that's the kind of thing we do at the premium side. Uh, And then you get really end up the deep dive analysis on some of the stocks we don't talk about on the free side. So that have been winners. Awesome. I'll be sure to link all those in the show notes. Thanks a lot, Beth. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Clay. Really appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts about this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.